best of our Welcome to another episode of the cast of r and I'm Hillary, a.k.a. Killer Hills. Bah, 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 bah. I'm Eddie Blackman, a.k.a. The Silver Fox. I'm just mm. going to stop saying Eddie Blackman and just go into The Silver Fox thing. I think you should still say Eddie Blackman. That's what I think. No one asked Because they're going to be like, who's the Silver Fox? There's so many Silver Foxes now during quarantine. The struggle is real. That is true. There's Puff. There's Kevin Lyles. There's a lot of them. That that's a different conversation for a different day. I think it's a just for men conversation and how maybe people can't get their deliveries on time. I don't know. Just a thought. I don't have these problems. I just have some grays in the front. I'd be like, fuck it, I'm out here, like whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Today we are interviewing someone <laughs> who has no grays. She's twenty three. She's a young singer with a gorgeous voice that I fell in love with in twenty nineteen. And, you know, I just, I think she's adorable. I just love Kiana Lede. She's so fun. Well, somebody, She's also ready to fight, which I appreciate. Somebody used to love her, but she broke somebody's heart. And that is very reflective on this new album. Mm, yes, someone got left on red and even called back and was like, wow, you really about to do this to me? That's crazy. Is that what people do these days? I don't know. I don't date anymore. I've I'm dating a long time. Sometimes, so like leave me a voicemail talking about a text message the whole point of a text message is so that i don't have to listen to a voicemail i feel like we're working backwards here <laughs> tell me about this newfangled dating kiana <laughs> what is it like dating at 23 by the way happy belated birthday aries can we get a hand clap i don't have the buttons oh you want the hand clap i do happy birthday wow wait is that the rolling thing <laughs> Something similar, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, we're, we're official over here. You want we're something? very professional. I love it. I got that thing just to be able to clap for myself. <laughs> <laughs> While you record? <laughs> yeah. For Listen, you never know when you need a round of applause. Yep. Baby, yes. ass clap. You never know. I just need that support, you know? Love yourself. 2020. It's important. So let's tell us how you loved yourself on your 23rd birthday in quarantine. How did, was there a Zoom call? Was there a lot of coffee? Was there, was there stuff in your fancy teapot? What happened? Yeah, um, I'm quarantining currently with my mans and he and one of my best friends got a bunch of my friends together to do like a curbside birthday party. So they all brought like cupcakes and little signs. So I was completely surprised. I had just released the album that day. So it was like obviously a really busy day, crazy day. And then he said, he like pointed to the window and was like, look, there's something outside. And I looked outside and it was all my friends with signs like twerk for us and kiki and happy birthday. And it, yeah, I'm obsessed with twerking too. That's, it's probably a symptom of how much coffee I drink. Honestly, I have like spaz attacks. It's just like, I just need to twerk or like moan really loudly. I don't know. It's just moan. something that I Moan, yeah. like do a run. Like, like, mm. Daddy. Mm. Okay. This is, that's yeah. a definite 23 vibe. Cause I'm not, mm -mm. I'm not doing I know. That. I'm just, but you I'm power to you. You do that. Thank you. I'm in a phase right now. I just, um, you know, I just feel it. I just need to be doing. <laughs> my thing is, if somebody pulled up and was like, twerk for us, I'd be like, it's my birthday. You twerk for me. I'm here to enjoy <laughs> the festivities. I didn't realize I had to bring the festivities to my own birthday. What? True. So when True. They but they know how much I genuinely love to twerk. So mm. it just makes sense. Mm. Okay. That's what, that's what okay. friends are for. So when they pulled up, did they play like Drake, Kiki, Do You Love Me? Like, how did that? Do you hate that song? <laughs> no, I love that song. I love it. I like any song that says Kiki in it. I mean, what are the other Kiki songs? Um, uh, um, um, it was Keisha, it was Tanya, it was Anya, it was Monique, it was Keezy, 
It was Kiki and mm. Nasty or 23 all I could say. Yeah. This feels like a Terrius song. Dream. This is a Terrius song? Yeah, that's Terrius's given name. Mm -hmm. Oh. Sound like it. Why are you going by his government name, though? Because, girl, I've been doing this a long time. Everybody gets called by their government name. At some point in time, Miss <laughs> Brown. Mm. I was, oh God, I was kind of jealous that I didn't have a nickname to intro myself with. Mm. Like, Fox, mm. like, I want, I want one like that. Yeah, Kiki. Kill a Kiki, but I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. so that's probably my That's name. true. I mean, mm. let's think about it. And We're going to, by the end, we'll give her some outro music and she can do it. Yeah. Her. Mm -hmm. her outro. We're going to see. We going to see. Her thug name because she grew up on the south side of Phoenix, which, you know, sounds very dangerous and sunny. We, <laughs> outside, warm. <laughs> honestly, you would be surprised that there are definitely some random shootings that help happen on the south side of Phoenix. Mm, why is it always the south side of every place? Why can't it be <laughs> south side? Anything just sounds dangerous. Why does it always have to be the south side? It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people don't um, don't know about South Phoenix. Like, no one really reps South Phoenix. They don't really know what goes on. They didn't there. put it in waiting to exhale. This is the struggle. Why did yeah. they represent your community <laughs> in the seminal film, Waiting to Exhale? How dare they? <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I also just don't really talk a lot about, like, my upbringing. I think I ran away from it a lot. Um, so now... Why? Um, I just feel like there was, I was told that I wasn't enough of anything a lot of the time. So I struggled to try and feel like what it was I was worth, what, what was worth telling about my life. And, um, that wasn't like now. And like I said, I moved away from Phoenix when I was 16. So I feel like I've been moving in LA for long enough that this is like my home. And I just kind of like left to forget about Phoenix. But, um, the reason that this album was so important to me was because I stopped running away from it. I stopped running away from where I came from and um, how I was raised and how I grew up and what I've been through. And so I actually went back to my childhood home. So the home that's on the cover of the album. Yeah. South Phoenix. Um, but yeah, South Phoenix is crazy out there. I mean, there'd be like, just an example, like gunshots outside, me and my brother would just like lay down on the floor. We had a whole drill. We'd be watching like Cake Boss or something random on the TV while we're like laying on the floor and just continue watching the TV. Like that was like normal shit, but nobody really knows about that life because no one reps South Phoenix. And, and that's funny because we were having a conversation, I think earlier today about who's the last, you know, major artist that's come out of Phoenix. And the only I asked, that came like, to who, who y'all repping? My mind was Jordan Sparks. Yeah, she was probably the only one, yeah, the only know. artist. There's a couple actors. Emma Stone is from Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not still, but yeah, not a lot of people come out of Phoenix. Mm. Jordan was like from the West Side. She's like from Glendale. South Phoenix is something completely different. I'm learning so very much. <laughs> So, so talk about your transition from, from Phoenix to LA at 16. Yeah. Um, well, actually, before she gets there, I want to hear about how you, you know, you didn't want to talk about how you grew up and stuff. And now you do. Like, let's hear it. Tell me about it. How growing up on the South Side. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I guess just being... Um, very young moving here and being a mixed girl everybody has always tried to tell me where i fit and i've always tried to search for that and i identify as a black woman i also identify as a mexican girl i also identify as a native american woman so um for me it was just really hard for me to find where i fit and i think a lot of that struggle came from from positions that I was put in when I was young that made me feel uncertain about who I was. Also growing up in Phoenix, like South Phoenix is the, there's South Phoenix and Maricopa are like really the only two places with a lot of like black and Mexican. It, those are heavily black and Mexican neighborhoods. Everywhere else outside of there is like all white. So I always felt out of place. And then when I came to LA, 
I saw everything was way more mixed. Like everybody was kind of chilling together. And, you know, I just felt a little bit, I felt more welcomed, but as I got more and more pushed further, more and more into the industry, I felt a little more isolated. Like there were certain things that I needed to do. You're constantly questioned on your blackness, constantly questioned on where you belong in the R&B space, in the urban space. I hate that word, but in the urban space. And um, I just, I didn't ever really know if people accepted me in a lot of spaces. Um, so that's why I ran away from it because not a lot of people rep it. Not a lot of people know about it. So they always questioned me. And now I'm like, no, because there's people like me, there's girls like me who grew up in South Phoenix that are Mexican and black and, or just black or just Mexican. And they grew up in the same area as me and nobody knows what the life is like there. So I would like to represent those types of girls and those types of young people. No, that's good. I mean, California is the place to go if you're, um, okay, who's, who's dinging? All right, that's me. Okay, Kiki. <laughs> I just got a new laptop. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> who's texting you, Kiki? <laughs> I, I Do, you love them. <laughs> Do you love them? Um, yeah, I don't know how to, I'm, you know, I have a low-key computer. I don't know how to be fancy. How's it going? I'm like, if you go to messages, Is preferences, it? maybe, maybe, and then you go to sounds, you can do, or you can probably just turn off messages on your, on your laptop. Preferences. And just appear, and then we won't have to hear the ding. Share screen. <laughs> no, definitely, <laughs> definitely don't do that, because we're recording this, and we don't want you out there like that. You say don't don't scroll Where to the, the left. Where the fuck is this? Girl, I don't know. Maybe so, if you put your phone on Do Not Disturb. Can I put my computer on Do Not Disturb? I mean, girl, maybe. Then you might disappear off the screen. I know. I don't know if you want to do that. Oh, true. Okay, wait. Hold on. I could be yourself. Internet. <laughs> The oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Options? No. You know what I do? I'm right so now? excited. I need, the, I need the Jeopardy uh, music right now. I this know. Do you have it? Do, 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 do. No, but I'm gonna I'm gonna load that for the next time that we interview somebody and they have an issue with their computer and they can't figure out mm. how to turn the sounds on. Mm, struggle. But we will be I victorious. I don't understand. They've also stopped texting you, so maybe. Yeah, it should be fine now, but honestly, I don't know if anybody else. I feel like I just turned on preferences. Window. Yeah, so if you, it should just be in, under preferences in general. And then it should say, notify me about messages, uh, save history, play sound effects, and uncheck play sound effects. Do you see that? And messages. Moon's light, moon's General. Light. Yep. Now look down. It should be save history. Notify me. Notify me when my oh. name is mentioned. Play yeah. sound. Uncheck that bitch. Oh <laughs> wow. You are so smart. Thank you. And that was so Apple support. <laughs> <laughs> I was told by Apple Care. <laughs> um All yeah, right. but to go back to your your question, you know, it's such a weird, weird thing to talk about. I think the world is becoming more mixed and the world is becoming more um, open-minded and with social media and everything, that's one of the good things that social media has done. Um, but I feel like the this generation and the generation before mine are really the guinea pigs for like all of this new shit that life has to bring. Um, so it's it's a confusing, Place, especially as a 23 year old you know I'm still just trying to figure out where my space is just as a person no race even included so it's just a very confusing weird time but all I know is I am deserving of the space that I'm in and um, I am black I am Mexican I am Native American and that's on that that is the yeah. key. and you shouldn't have to choose and California is a great place to be able to be all parts of yourself and see other other people who you know 
are living the same lives um, and you see yourself reflected. And I think, you know, it can be struggling. It can be a struggle rather when you come from places where you don't see a lot of people that are biracial um, or mixed race or somebody that just looks like you. Um, and so I'm happy that you found a place because it does suck when you're like, wow, it's just really white, black or Mexican, huh? Like I can't, you know, <laughs> making me choose. No, I just really, I'm not really doing testing and the word other like I would always have to click other. other and sometimes it wouldn't like it wouldn't let me click multiple boxes and that always confused me so I would always be other and that was just like the start of my journey like even in school the most basic thing like testing would be like the most confusing thing for me mm. did your parents have to ride on people for being like we need to put Kiana in this specific space and they're like listen my daughter is a lot of things please don't box her box her in yeah, I don't think my parents ever really talked to me. I mean, my dad wasn't in my life until I was like 12. Yeah. Um, and we didn't really talk about stuff like that. Um, we just, I just knew I was black. Like my whole family's black, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, like everybody in my family's black. So like to us, it was just like, I'm black. And then my mom, you know, she never, the, the mom side is a little bit more confusing because my mom's dad was deported back to Mexico before she was even born. Oh, so wow. culturally, I don't even understand that. I, I wish I understood my culture even more rather than just growing up in the culture. I wish I would have known my Mexican family um, just so I could be even closer to that side of me. Um, so that's why that was a little confusing. My mom never let me forget that. My mom also, she's a history teacher. She always taught me like what, like true history of our country and of the world. So, um, yeah, she's always been really like, she always educates me in the right ways for sure. So that's good. What's the, what's the ethnic breakdown? Your dad is? My dad is black and white and my mom is Mexican, but she's native Mexican. So her dad was like. Native, Native Mexican, and her mom is Norwegian. Oh, there's a lot. Okay. Of yeah. Oh, it sounds like my nephew. He's like black, Filipino, and Romanian. We're all over the place. Wow. Yeah. Black we're Filipino we're all over the place. So beautiful. We're just, we're just. But I think, I think, a uh, old call worker was like when I told him about like going to pick up my my nieces and nephews and stuff, and my son, frankly who is African-American, Gambian, and Jamaican. Uh, they're like, oh God, like you're just really living in 2050. I'm like, I guess, but <laughs> like, <laughs> as a Californian, like we've been here. We, we, on. we, we just, you know, everybody be dating everybody. Everybody's like, there's a military base. Like people just, I don't know. So that's why I said- You said, said military base? Yeah, like I grew up near a military base, so you're like, oh, cool. Like, a hey, military base. Oh, nice. I was too in England. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher is oh. trash, though, so I couldn't get dual citizenship. She's oh. dead, not sad about it, but you know, as we move on. Um, oh. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a definite thing that comes out in your music. It comes out in what you um, are singing about. And then also just like, you have time give yourself time to like see all the sides and like learn more about different histories of different sides of your family um but yeah so tell me how does it play into at all your your most recent album do you feel like <clears throat> yeah it definitely does i think um also just growing up in phoenix in general plays a lot into my album i had so much time to digest music from all different genres. Um, I had two favorites, R&B and singer-songwriter music. So I listened to a lot of like Nora Jones, Sarah Bareilles, John Mayer, and then also, you know, Usher, Chris Brown, Brandy, like everybody in the R&B space. Um, and also the pop space, because it was pop when I was growing up too, so. Um, but my yeah, favorite R&B radio station out there? Well, it's, Pandora it's, it's, was, was alive and well when I was growing up. Yeah, there, there. Say different, different times, you know. Yeah, yeah. very different times. But I that also listened good. to a lot of 
like Etta James, Ella Fitzgerald. Um, one of the schools that I went to was a performing arts school and they played us a lot of like um, funk and soul. And um, yeah, so I just, I had a really wide range of music that I listened to, but those were my two favorites. And my favorite of all favorites that sat in the middle when I was growing up was Alicia Keys because she, you know, had that soul and that R&B voice and melodies and everything. And then her songwriting was very singer songwriter. It was very, um, had the honesty of R&B and the sexiness of R&B, but the description of a singer songwriter. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of that is reflected in your music. And the first time that I saw you perform was at the BMI showcase. I think it was at the Soho House maybe a few years ago. Oh. Yeah, so uh, my good friend Wardell was like raving about you. And, he's, and I happened to be in LA. And he said, you have to come see this amazing, you know, singer, songwriter. And he, he actually introduced us and I said, you're going to be a star. You probably don't remember that, but let's act like you do. And make Yeah, it I, yes, that was so nice. Hey, Eddie. <laughs> Tell me I'm important and that you remember uh, meeting me in the absolutely. sea of people. I remember the guy with the gray hair. One thousand percent, I remember you. <laughs> that is so nice. Thank Did you. Did you remember the silver fox, Kiki? Yes, I totally remember the silver fox. <laughs> well, the interview done. Thanks for tuning in. Yourself as the silver fox. <laughs> so I used to, I used to manage Ro James and Ro. <laughs> He was the one we were on tour. Uh, we were on tour with Maxwell and, and Mary in Europe. And I don't know why out of nowhere, he just said, yo, you're the silver fox. And it just kind of. <laughs> Ro would be the one to give you that name. I hate him. You can, thank, you can thank Ronnie Tucker next time you see him. Everybody gets the government. Oh, my, oh gosh. my God. Wait, yeah. his real name was Ronnie? I didn't even know that. His real name is, is Oh, I'm Ronnie. calling him Ronnie from now on. Ro Ro I would go with Ro, too. I would go with Ro also. Ro James signed to RCA, which you were also signed to as well, right? Yep. So tell us about the, the RCA. Experience. Um, well, I'm very grateful that it happened. You know, I'm Ooh, look oh, at the political the, answer. The, here the, here the, we, were, we were ESPN. We'd be like, I'm going to do a quick... <laughs> Socially distanced, <laughs> truthful answer. This, okay. is, this is, mind you, this is the record deal that she signed, the 360 deal with no advance. Is this the RCA that you're talking about? Yes, it is. Go it's ahead and spill okay. the tea. No okay. advance. How did that yeah. happen? I had no advance. When I first signed, I was 15. Um, so basically what happened, what had happened was mm. I signed the deal when I was, so I was in this kid's competition my mom goes harder for me than anybody else. I told her not to sign me up for this competition. She did it anyway, because she's like, I know you're going to be a star. I'm just going to sign you up. And I was like, my baby. Okay. So, <laughs> so she signed me up for this competition. I got really far. When we got into the top five, we had to sign this contract if we wanted to, pers to, if we wanted to go any further and progress in the competition. So, of course all these parents like not knowing like what a contract is like what my mom is a teacher my stepdad's an electrician like n my family doesn't know shit about contracts like that all they know is that they want me to be able to pursue my dreams mm -hmm. so my mom signed the contract i won the competition rca had the chance to sign me the wow i've never actually said their name in this story but they had the chance to sign me. They did. They gave me a song to release. They gave me three options. I released one song out of those three options. Um, it was a song I won't talk about. Is that um, No! <laughs> if she looked like a Disney kid. I was like, is she a cheetah girl? No! You look like a damn cheetah girl on the signal, the single art. I was like, things have changed. Stop it. So yeah, I was we, we first of all, research. don't worry, go ahead. <laughs> Wait, was I 15 or 16 when that actually got released? I think I was 16 at, the, at that time. I don't remember. I was either 15 or 16. I released a song. Um, again, it was 360, no advance. So um, 
five, I was going back and forth before I could drive officially, before I got my license, my stepdad was driving me. I was doing auditions in LA and I was doing sessions. So he would drive me every single weekend to come to LA to be able from to- Phoenix? Music yeah. From Phoenix? Music from Phoenix. That's commitment. How long is that drive? Like eight hours. I was Top. gonna say, I know Vegas is like- 5.30 to like eight five, hours. Like five hours. Okay, it, yeah. five but or six. It, when, Depends on when you leave, because Phoenix has traffic and LA has traffic. So it can end up being eight, but typically it's like six to eight. Gotcha. So my stepdad would drive me every weekend. And it just got to the point where I was like, I have gotta go. Like, I'm done with Phoenix, I'm, d- I, I'm ready. So my mom was like, okay. She put me into an online school. Um, I obviously had to save up the money to be able to move. Cause like, I just- didn't. Who did you move in with if you're 15? <clears throat> Well, when I was going back and forth, okay, so before I got my license, my stepdad would drive me every weekend. Then yes. there was a little bit of time where I would stay with one of my friends who was like 19 or 20, who I'd grown up with and my parents really trusted. And got he it. lived in LA, so I would just stay with him for a long time, for like a month and then go back home, a month, go back home. Then um, I got my license and I was able to drive myself back and forth every weekend. Then it just got to the point where I was like, all right, enough driving back and forth. It's time for me to go. I got to go to LA. So my mom enrolled me in online school. My 18 year old best friend and I moved to LA. We had to save up money. Her mom was a manager at a CVS. So we worked at CVS to save up money. Then we moved to LA. And, and then scroll I- away toothpaste and toilet paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then um, I worked at the gymnastics center and did like a couple days a week which was like the only job I could find at the time that would- Were you a gymnast also in your part-time? I was a gymnast when I was a child. Like not you even- I would a gymnast, But you don't have to know how to do a backflip to be able to teach a backflip. So mm. if anything has taught you anything about teaching in America, you don't actually have to be good at something to Dang. be able to teach it. Don't so, listen to us, Gabby Douglas. We're sorry. We apologize, Simone Biles. <laughs> 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 Disrespecting the craft. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's mom. Um, <laughs> so I uh, taught gymnastics and then I, that wasn't enough still. So I needed to do more jobs. I sang demo sessions for like some big pop producers and pop writers. Um, and then I was also doing sessions once or twice a day, uh, writing for myself and for other artists. And then I also worked at a jazz club when I was underage somehow. So all of this sounds super safe. It was not safe at all, but it was so fun. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, eventually I got dropped at 17 and started from square one, had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and what was that started. like for you at 17? And first of all, let's run back and say, this is Eddie Ding Ding. What is a 360 deal, Eddie, for those of us at home that maybe don't know? 360 deal is where they sign you your entire life. They have, they being the record label, have uh, an interest in anything that you do, whether it be recorded music, touring, merch, any ancillary things that you do. So they basically have ownership in everything that you do because the thought is if we're going to put money into you and build you as an artist and a career, then we're going to have a... Uh, a piece of that across the board. And as a historical asterisk, these really started popping up around the ringtone age. So like 2007, 2008, and everybody was really mad about it. And then they sort of like quietly kept them going. Uh, and they would apparently sign up uh, young teenagers I'm like Miss Kinky with that. Mm-hmm. And so then once you were out of 360, slavery situation uh how was that were you like oh my god I got dropped I'm so sad or were you like oh my god I could actually give my tour money this is great what were your thoughts Uh, I was sad as fuck um I felt like I I was special because like I had a leg up because I was only 17 with a record deal just moved to LA was working with all these people meeting like celebrities and songwriters and jazz clubs and like doing all this crazy shit 
and I had a deal already. So like anyone that I wanted to get in a session with, I could always approach with the fact that I had a deal at such a young age. And then when that was taken away from me, I was like, how the fuck do I start over? Like, what am I going to say now? I'm just like, like, you know, square one. So, um, I, I took it really harshly. Plus I felt like I did, I wasn't good enough for them to want to keep on. Cause when you're mm. 17, you're a teenager. Like you can't, you can't comprehend that it's business. You you're know, it's junior, a, a senior in high school at this point, right? Yeah. It was a really emotional experience for me. I took it very personally and I didn't, I couldn't understand why somebody didn't see the potential in me. Um, and just frankly didn't give a fuck. And um, yeah, so then I was depressed as fuck. In a major depressive episode, I was in my room, didn't come out for like six months. Um, and then eventually I, I had, so the guy who produced who, one of the guys who produced the album that I just released, Kiki, um, I met him through my first deal at the end of my first deal and his partner, um, his production partner, Kevin White. So I had met them at the end of that deal and they- What's the first guy's name? Mike Woods. Um, and I actually call him by his government. He is Michael and he has only ever been Michael to me. <laughs> Everybody gets the government at one, it, one point in time. It, Got to do it. Got it too. Um, so Michael Woods um, and Kevin White, I met them in my last deal and they were like big brothers to me. They really believed in me. They always checked up on me, always gave me a shoulder to cry on. Um, and they saw how depressed I was and they didn't leave my side. Like they were just like the only people who stuck with me from that deal and moved on with me. Um, they told me themselves, like, we really believe in you and we want to keep working with you. And they were kind of going through a similar situation with their, whatever deal they were in. I don't remember what it was, but, um, so we were just kind of going like right in the wave together, trying to figure it out. And we did, uh, we started doing covers, um, and we were doing them for like a year and then it was just my time. Like, it was just magic time. This was like the first push for me I got my first TV show, um, I- Which was? Had, uh, MTV Scream, mm -hmm. long time ago. And then I got my uh, first a million views on a video when we did Hotline Bling. And then I got my record deal with Republic, who I'm now with. And what year is this then? This was- <laughs> Thank you for the cheers, Daddy. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, trying to lighten the emotional load in the Zoom room. Yes, 20, wait, like four years ago? Okay. Maybe a little less. So did you write your songs with them too? Because I know it looks like Aaron Ray is your songwriting partner. No, so no, no, he's not my songwriting partner, but I've oh. known him for years. I, when I first moved here, he was like my crew. Um, it was him, uh, Major Maja, Dion Gill and Akili, the girl that I moved out here with, that was, um, that's my squad. Okay. Uh, which is really cool because, you know, he's having a moment right now and I'm really proud of him. His music is amazing. He's always been incredible. And we met up at the Roots Jam for the sound check. And it was just crazy. Like we had that moment of like, this is what we used to talk about when we were teenagers when we first moved here. And we had like such big dreams and now like, this is happening and we're coming up together. It's just such a cool experience. So I just want to know who broke your heart to mm. produce this amazing <laughs> album because... She had to call her father. She was like, I don't know why you're talking to me like that. My dad is crazy. My dad calls me every three days to get mad at me about what I said in those songs. Like, he's like, do you realize that everybody mm -hmm. thinks I'm crazy now? And I'm like... You are crazy. Why? He's like, who are you talking about? Are you talking about your stepdad? And I'm like, no, I'm talking about you because the reason I am the way I am is because of you. Thanks a lot. He's like, now I got to drive out of California and fight people. <laughs> like, look what you've done. That's a yeah. whole six to eight hours, Kiana. He's wild. Yeah, he's five hours. Well, from Gilbert. <laughs> you <laughs> said with traffic. <laughs> yeah. Depending on what time he leaves. I've oh. been listening. She said there's traffic in Phoenix and there's also traffic in LA. So there's, there's 
fucking traffic in Phoenix. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of heartbreak. Um, and not only just with men either, like with my female friends. Um, I just love really hard, like my family, my friends, my, my man, like everybody that I love in my life, I love them for so many reasons. And I remind for those reasons every single day I remind myself and I'm just really grateful for the people that are in my life. Um, I'm a very open book, but it takes um, a lot for people to crack me open to a certain level. Like there's, there's only a certain layer that I shed to the world. And even when I do like share things with people, I try and share them um, from a place of strength and like I'm over it now so I can talk about this mm -hmm. rather than like in my weakest moments. I don't like to look vulnerable. I don't like to look weak. I want to come at it from a place of like strength and positivity. Um, so yeah, it's the, when I go through heartbreaks and when I go through loss of friends or whatever, I take it really harshly and that's where the songs come from. Mm. Where she's ready to fight. I'm she's with it. Throw blows. And that's the, that is the person I am though, because I don't like being vulnerable, I will be angry first <laughs> and then I'll cry. <laughs> oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your what's your songwriting process in that in that experience are you just like ripping up pieces of paper and then you're like okay cool i'm gonna write it down now <laughs> yeah i just rip up really, i'm just gonna text, text it to myself because you can't rip up phones so you got to rip up paper and then you're like okay i'm serious i'm putting this in my notes app <laughs> yeah um i uh my songwriting process i guess is pretty much been the same every time I just Michael and Kevin and Boston and Pat um they produce something that I like or I'll just tell them like a feeling that I want and we're so close that like it just makes like it always just makes sense it always just happens um and then I'll do some melodies this this last album in particular was really cool because I had Derek Milano in the camp and um I gave him so much shit when he first showed up to the session and I didn't know why he showed up so late, but he did the typical like pop and writer thing. You know, he showed up like two hours late and I was like, Hmm. So I was giving him shit. And then when he did his first melody take, I was like, okay, it's I guess, I guess it's like fine that you were late. I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but I'm a little impressed. So I'm gonna but let don't it slide. Let that shit happen again. <laughs> exactly exactly so i said that to him and he ended up telling me that the reason that he was so late was because he was so scared to come in and like derek is like a big teddy bear like he's just a big dude like you wouldn't it's just crazy to think that he's like he was so um scared to show up to a session and do something outside of his comfort zone you know because he's a very outgoing outrageous guy um, but yeah, he was really nervous, but he ended up being able to write about things that he wouldn't normally write about. Um, with him, it's really fun to write because I feel like he gives me a good thesis statement and it always pertains to what I'm going through in that moment. So like, he'll say something like, you don't even know what's crazy until you seem like kind of crazy. And then I'll just go off and uh, have <laughs> so many cocoa. stories. Like, my can... girl went loco. <laughs> Um, that's why it was really fun working with him. I think our, our styles just fit together so well. I, I hadn't found anybody yet that allowed me to like freestyle and just like write everything that was in my head um, in such a perfect way. I feel mm -hmm. like it wasn't really any different writing with him than it was when I would like sit down at my piano growing up and write songs by myself um, because he gave me such a good outline and like really pushed me to be, you know, a strong strong writer um so yeah it was it was a little different working with him but always melody comes first um and something gets freestyled in the gibberish phrases something makes sense or you make something out of the gibberish and um or you just hit a high note and keep it moving <laughs> <laughs> and it'll always end up circling back to what what i'm going through you know, there's a handful of your records that are very piano driven. Is that because you started on the piano and that's like, for instance, I work with John Legend. I've worked with John for, you know, many of years. And a lot of times he starts a lot of his songs and melodies just based upon the piano. And then sometimes he 
you know, leaves them as such and they become hit records like Ordinary People or All of Me. Don't know if you've ever heard of those records. Um, but then other times there's, you know, there's this John Legend. There's this guy, he's, you know, we'll, we'll talk about him later. But, um, but then obviously there's, there's songs that are produced afterwards. So is that why you have songs that are very piano driven? Is that because that was, was that done on purpose? Yeah, I, I get, not really, like, um, This is the secret, I, like, do you play any instruments, it. Kiana? Question. Yeah, I play yeah. piano and I play guitar. Piano was my first instrument. I grew up with, like, a little baby grand um, in my mom's house. She found one at a garage sale for, like, super cheap one day and brought it home, and I just never left it. Um, but, yeah, I... Okay, Michael plays piano. He grew up playing piano in church. He's like, if, if an instrument was another language, okay, piano would be his first language. He is so incredible, flawless, perfect, just perfect pianist. Um, and that obviously inspires a lot of his production because that's his first instrument. Um, and I think for me, the reason the best songs come out let me rephrase that. The reason that a lot of the songs that I put out are very piano driven is because my best songs are piano driven because I'm so comfortable on the piano because I grew up playing the piano as well. So yeah, I think uh, piano definitely has a lot to do with, with the music I make. All right, cool. So tell us a little bit about like working with Ari Lennox on this project, um, shooting a quarantine video, like how was that? For chocolate. It was so fun. Um, it was fun. It was funny because I think we both knew it was just going to be something that no one's ever done and like it's going to be a little awkward because the lag and like there's just all these empty spaces and like it's just it was just a weird funny. You're in your bedroom. I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> exactly. The song's called Chocolate. Neither one of us chocolate. Like just there's a lot going on. Trying to do what we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really fun though. I mean, Ari, I, I feel like one of the reasons that people like Ari and and also me so much is because we're just very genuine people. Like we're not afraid to look stupid and we're just ourselves completely. Um, and we definitely did that, that in the video. We were just acting crazy. <laughs> She's had a really uh, high high times and low times on social. Um, is there anything maybe you've learned from her experience in terms of sharing maybe too much or like not enough or like trying to find your own balance? Yeah, um, it's funny because we talked about that actually when we did the chocolate video before we started recording, we were just catching up and I was talking to her about how I really admire her for her just being able to be just who she is on Instagram live. And I know that some people give her, I mean, a lot of people give her shit for it. Um, and it's really hard not to take it personally, especially when you're such a genuine person. You think everyone's coming from such a genuine place. But I really appreciate that Ari is exactly who she is and she's completely herself. Um, we were talking about that and I was just giving her props on it and telling her how much I appreciate it. And she was saying like, I was telling her some of my own fears. Like, I don't know if you've seen me, what I posted on, on Instagram a couple weeks couple months ago now actually but I was saying how there's a few pictures that I posted um in a carousel and I was saying these are pictures that I debated for hours on posting because I'm so afraid of social media I have like a crazy fear of social media um like it was so bad to the point where I wouldn't even caption my own shit I would send it to Jasmine one of my managers I would send everything that I was going to post to her even anything on my story because I just wanted to make sure that it was going to be okay and like I wasn't gonna get shit for it or I wasn't gonna, I don't know. It's just, it's a really um, scary time. And when I was younger, um, I went through a lot of um, online bullying. Um, I just dated the wrong person. They had a bunch of little fangirls and they all came for me all the time for being black, for having a bigger nose, for having chapped lips. Like a lot of it was racist shit. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, it was. It was pretty. It was pretty fucked up. But I got a lot of hate all the time. It felt like everyone hated me online. So that's where that kind of started. 
Um, and I was telling her, like, I just have this, like, crazy fear of social media, and I just applaud her for being exactly who she is. And she was saying, she gave me some advice, and she was like, you know, I feel like you do it right. Like, you do it just, just enough to where people get to see who you are, but you still get to save some for yourself so people aren't constantly commenting on your own character um, all the time because they don't really have that much ammo. She was like, I just am who I am. Like, I just am who I am. Doesn't matter if the cameras are or not. I'm just I talking. adore Ari. She's fucking hilarious. Ari's Ari's from brother. the door, I was like, you are so funny. Like, she did this, she did this, like, conversation with her and Summer Walker, and I was in tears. Like, when Summer was like, no, my ass is fake. It's just, I, it's just a little something. And Ari was like, oh my God, can I touch it? I'm so, oh my God. Like, I was in tears. She was like, yeah, I dated girls too. You know, just a little butch tag, you know, whatever. And Ari was like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I, she's hilarious. She was like, I try to get at women, but they just look at me. Nobody ever tries to actually date me. It's terrible. She's <laughs> all hot. Oh, so I want to go, right. go back on something real quick that you that you touched on with the online bullying. So the guy that you were dating at the time, what was his ethnicity? He was Italian Australian. So he was white. Yep. Was this a Phoenix relationship or an LA relationship? This was an LA relationship. Um, I didn't really date anyone. My parents were really strict, so I didn't. Date anyone. That's interesting because I I. I would imagine that living in LA and just the kind of openness of LA. Mm. I'm a Californian. I'm going to have to weigh in and say nah. Like people Inter are very. Interracial dating runs yeah. very pre is very prevalent in Phoenix, right? Interracial dating is prevalent in California, but it's like people are still California stupid about well, it. And I think that it would be more accepting in California than it would be. Yeah, but you have to remember this wasn't like face-to-face -face bullying. This was online. And it ended up being face-to-face -face when I would visit him on tour or visit him like anywhere else in the world. These girls, it was just jealousy, you know? It's just like the girls wanted to be with him so bad that somebody that did not look like, like them mm -hmm. dating the person that they wanted to be with so bad was like, it was even more of a, a stab in the heart and a twist. And um, yeah, they they did not like me for it but I just that and it feels like a whole nother life honestly it feels like a whole nother life but it was online so people obviously I'm sure a lot of those people would not have said half the shit that they said to me to my face of course and actually a couple of girls would come to me when they saw me face to face and they would be like I was this account and I just want to apologize like I'm really sorry for the things I said. You're actually so nice. And like, I just feel really bad. Some of them did have conscious, consciousness. Consciousness? Interesting. A conscious? consciousness? Consciousness. Uh, and a conscious. A they conscience. were conscious. And they had a conscience. Look at yeah. that. They would come up into a song. But that was still very few. There was a time where I got spat on. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Are they did? Did you hit them with a brick? A shovel? Your phone? Your high heel? Something. Yeah, I should have. No, I just ran away. Mm. That's why I'm always ready to fight. Now. now. Noted. Got you. Remember, remember when Pac had Thug Life chat tatted on his chest? She's got Kiki tatted on her arm. Be remember how Nikki Giovanni is also a poet, and she also has Thug Life on hers. Poets be about them things, too. Be about yes. Them. That is clear. So to switch it to a little bit of a lighter note, tell us about working with um, with Black because I really like that song and just like hanging out in that lower register a little bit. And I feel like the vibes of this album are very like low key, like warm chords and like good melodies and like vibey. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was that honestly was so surprisingly meant to be. I knew that I wanted Black on a song. I just love his shit. I think he's awesome. Um, and I had just finished the album. I was flying somewhere. I don't remember where I was going, but I was on plane. Look at, look at this flossiness. Like, we can't even leave the house. And she's like, oh my God, I was flying. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'm jealous of me back then too, okay? <laughs> We're all jealous. 
<laughs> um, yeah, I got a message from him on Instagram and he said, just tapping in huge fan. And I was like, wow, what a perfect moment. And I already knew I wanted him with second chances. So by that time, I knew I wanted him with second chances. So I sent him, I messaged him back and I was like, great, cause I have a song for you. My album's coming out soon. And he was like, amazing, text it to me right now. I texted it to him and I took off on the plane. And by the time I landed wherever I was going, I think it was like Minneapolis or something. By the time I had landed, he sent me the song. Mm-hmm. He works quick. All right, yeah. Tell us about like the lucky day. I heard in another story that you had to chase him down. Like you had to like holler at him directly in person and was like, we are going to do this very right now because I cannot trust you yeah. apparently he, to respond to emails brown. or texts or promises. Yeah. Uh-huh. He's a liar. It sounds like lucky day is a liar. <laughs> you like, we're going to do this thing. Never doing it. <laughs> I'm going to call he you tomorrow. Is- Never calls. Wait a minute. The government, <laughs> D Brown, D Brown. <laughs> Dean Brown, Lucky is just such a mysterious guy. Like, is it or is it just like he just doesn't return return fucking text? That's not mysterious. He just didn't send it. I don't know what he does. Honestly, I don't know what he does every day. What he's doing right now, couldn't tell you. I couldn't even guess. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's lots of things you could do at home, and I just don't. I don't know what he's doing. Um, but we've been good friends since the Ella tour. And I always give him shit for not responding to me, always. And this time when I sent him the song, I knew he wanted to do it, but he was traveling in Australia, which if he can't respond when he's not on tour, imagine what it's like when he's on tour in another country. So he was on tour in Australia. There was absolutely no way I was getting this song anytime soon. And then um, Grammys happened and I, we went to the Ella 10 Summers party and I saw him there. And we, we obviously had seen each other a few times during the week. And um, I just kept hunting him down and telling him, you already said. He, the thing is, he already wrote the verse. So it was like just about getting him to record it in the studio. Um, so How long did you chase him we were at- in the studio? Weeks, three weeks, give me days, like two weeks, three weeks, months? It was probably like two weeks, but like I wanted to just get it done. Like I was just like, we need, we need to just do it. Like you need to just record it. And I knew that it was done already for like two weeks. He had already written it. It was literally just about laying it down. You're kind, because so, I'd be like, where the fuck is my shit? <laughs> oh, I did, but he didn't respond. <laughs> Even when I, he, no, here's how you know. I am telling the truth. I even sent him a, a video once of him, of me listening to the Fade Away, the one song that was on the Issa Rae and the Keith Stanfield movie. And I sent him a video saying like, wow, this is the first time I'm hearing this song and I'm like so amazed by you. This song is crazy. He didn't even respond to that. So when I saw him in person, the next time I saw him, I said, what the fuck is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> you, you never respond to me. <laughs> Hillary, I'm putting up my dukes because this is Kiana's love language. So funny, we can go right now. Um, yeah, but he was like, I'm sorry, you know I love you, I just can't. And like everybody that knows him knows that this is just what he does, but I took it very personally, like I said. It's took it very personally. She's an Aries, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, we went into the studio um, during Grammy week at the after the 10 summers and Ella um, party we went to the studio and it was me him and queen and dab and like um jaylian like just everyone that we knew um just chilling in the studio and he did it and it was so much fun i'm actually glad he didn't send it to me i'm glad that we had that experience I'm glad you another you got memory you under the belt <laughs> of the album kiki <laughs> So one more question about the album, maybe two. Tell us a little bit about these throwback beats that you use, like Mutume's Juicy, which is Biggie's Juicy, and then also Brandy. And is, are those the two that I'm... And there's Madden. There there's Outcast. There's Outcast. So fresh and so clean. Come on now. Hillary's my favorite. Um, I, I mean, my favorite throwback song that we use on the album was Happy Ever. It's one of my favorite songs. Um, Very dramatic teen angst. It is. I, I 
believe it or not, I used to run to that song and not that it's a good song to run to, but I just used to like use my sadness to propel me forward. Ooh. And I would just be so in the zone because it's such an amazing song. Like it would just take me out of the entire world. Like I would just be focused on the song That's and all the ad libs. Very philosophical. Yeah. It's a slow mm. song, but it made me want to have this burst of energy to go up Runyon Canyon. Yeah. And then take a selfie at the top. And this is where they shot insecure. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Duck face. Duck lips. <laughs> random, it was random. definitely an abuser of the duck lips time. Oh. As a fellow <laughs> big lip lady, we really don't have to. We could just like be alive and give yeah. you that. You don't have to do it. As a black <laughs> man. That's the uh, crime. Love, I don't know what your lip game the, is. I don't know if you have like the lip game or if you need to do duck lips, Eddie. Do you need to do duck lips? No. Do not, men do I duck just, lips? I just put chapstick on. I mean. Oh. I don't think he knows what duck lips are. I, 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 I do know what duck lips are. So can you answer the question? Do you do it? No, I don't. Look at her. <laughs> the competition. Here we go. Mm. I don't want that smoke. I don't want that Arizona smoke. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm from. I know where you're from. I'm learning. Shout, 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 shout. Thug life, thug life. I would, I would Tuki stand up. I would Tuki 24. Meet me at the movie theater. <laughs> AMC. Meet me at the AMC. I would Tuki yep. 24. Yeah, you know AMC show. is a chain though, right? Like they got AMC. Yeah, but the AMC 24, the AMC 24 is the hangout spot. That's it's answer. Walmart. It's AMC Ooh. 24. Who is calling you, Kiana? I'm, that, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's actually. Is it black? Is it lucky? Is it's it not lucky. lucky. We know that from the research. Mm -mm. He doesn't call. Yeah, lucky would never call me. <laughs> tell your boo you got 10 more minutes with us, and then you're going to holler at him. Because that was, that was mm -hmm. the FaceTime call. Yeah. And tell him to hit us with some Banks beer and some flying fish. Flying fish cutter would be perfection. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm allergic to fish. Oh, that's terrible. So what do you feel like has changed the most between recording myself and Kiki? Um, what has changed the most? Yeah. I think I just gave less of a fuck about what people wanted from me. Oh. Myself. So this, this is like the journey of my albums that I like to give. Selfless, the first EP that I released, mm -hmm. was very much me, but it was a lost and depressed version of me. Um, you can tell on the cover, like I'm just kind of like somber and just, I look sad because I was in that time. I was very sad. And then um, I released myself and myself, I was fucking, sass queen i had the makeup did the hair did the nails did everything did done i was twerking everywhere and wearing my share and donna summer outfits um and yes. diana ross yes. i got my on and um i loved it it was such a fun time i think for me um that time I was very confident, but I still cared a lot about what people thought. And that was when I was also, I had been through a fresh breakup. It was the first time that I wanted to be by myself and wanted to explore who I was as a young black and brown woman um, and experience like, you know, just living in my early twenties on my own in my apartment by myself for the first time. Just, I had this whole new sense of independence, but because of my young twenties, I really still cared about what people thought. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to like my music. I wanted to be enough. Um, that doesn't go away when you get older. FYI. FYI. Great. <laughs> Great. You'll get um, to a point where you just don't give a fuck, but like it doesn't magically disappear because you old bitch. Continue. Right. So, then um, it got a little overwhelming, if I'm being honest. Like, I hate doing my hair. I hate straightening my hair. I hate doing hair in general. I like doing makeup, but I don't 
I feel like dirty when I have it on my face. I have very sensitive skin. I don't know what I was doing wearing that much foundation anyway. And glitter was very hard to get off to do it every night on tour. It felt like I was trying to keep up with this life that like I didn't actually have. Um, and it wasn't me on my off days. I did. I'm a very genuine person. Everything you see is what you get. I am who I am. And I felt like on my off days, I didn't look the same as I did on my on days when I was being Keanu the day the artist. And that's just not, that's just not me because I'm always me. Um, and I realized that the perception that people were getting of me was a different um, version of me than who I actually was. I wanted people to be able to just see me for who I was and just listen to my voice and not get distracted by all the glitter and shit um, because the glitter doesn't matter. Like the, like that shit does not matter. It just matters about who I am and what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to heal people with my music and um, give people something to look forward to and a person to look to. Um, and I just wanted to put more emphasis on that than um, the glitz and glamor of it all. Well, I want to commend you because not a lot of young ladies your age and especially in this business and given the things that you have gone through at, you know, being dropped from a record label and bullying and all of those things, a lot of young ladies would have probably stopped doing what you're doing. So I want to commend you on, you know, on continuing this journey and understanding that, hey, you know, fucking makeup, you know, gloss. <laughs> So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, too, and I've been a little bit open about this online, um, I was raped. And mm. I have had a really hard time with my sexuality. Like, um, when I first moved to LA, you guys know, I was super young, and I was in a lot of rooms with a lot of older people, and I was put in a lot of really uncomfortable positions at a very young age, and I thought I was equipped to handle it, um, but I wasn't. I was trying to act like a grown-ass woman, and I, I wasn't, and I'm dealing with a lot of that shit now. Um, I've gotten a lot better, but I think in the myself time, um, I was trying to prove to people that it didn't fucking matter what you wore, it didn't matter, like none of it mattered people are just gonna be people. And I was trying to, after I was raped last year, I wanted to prove that I still loved myself. I wanted to prove that to people. I wanted to say like, fuck you, fuck what you did. I'm still, all the work that I did to become this confident, independent woman that I am, it's still here. It still works mm -hmm. and I matter. And um, I think I just took it, I took it a little too far, but it's all in learning. And um, now, you know, I just, I am who I am and I know that I'm not just like, I'm not just glitz and glamour and twerking. Like that can be a part of me for sure, but that's not all I am. That's not all I'm worth. Yeah. And you also should be able to have the freedom to be who you are and all your different facets. Like sometimes you want to be chill. Sometimes you want to be Diana Ross. Sometimes you want to be Diana Ross and mahogany. Sometimes you want to be the Diana Ross. that's like, I got pulled over for drunk driving, but I can only serve on the weekends. Yes. <laughs> exactly we're multifaceted okay <laughs> i think that's good i think it's good and you got to give yourself space too man because the industry doesn't necessarily give you space so you have to make sure that you dictate it for yourself like cool okay leave me the fuck alone right now i'm gonna go home just chill out or else i'm not gonna have anything to actually write about because i will be burnt out nobody that's wants so that true. It's weird because at this time, it's kind of like opposite. Like, I feel like I've chilled out so hard that I have n nothing to write about. Like, I can only write about past experiences. Mm. Um, and I mean, there's still like, you know, there's still sparks here and there of life happening. But because you're stuck in one place, your brain gets, your brain gets stuck. Your brain gets crammed and you only, it's like you only have one POV right now. One mm. perspective. Um, so yeah, it's been a little weird for that, but we're working with it. And I know that you had like the European tour that was supposed to be coming on like this month. So now we've, I assume, postponed it. So like, how was that experience sort of like as a young singer dropping this great album that you were like very uh, much showing who you are 
to your fans and in you know in turn gathering new fans and all of this and then i'm sure they were like we're gonna put you on tour we're gonna put you here you're going here you're going here we're gonna work 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 and then it's like we're not gonna work in that way we're going to shoot a chocolate video in your room in her room we're mm-hmm. gonna do social distancing it's gonna be virtual and then you know how's that been for you it's been weird um i'm like a person who is needs to see people in real life to feel connected and to feel that real impact um, that my fans and that I have had and share with the music. Um, So it's been a little weird. We haven't been able to like celebrate the way we thought we were going to be able to. Um, You know, I had all these like album release shows and the album release party and then the Europe tour and the US tour. So, um, yeah it's been it's been interesting definitely not how i expected it to go it sucks because like i said i'm a very like i need to see it in person to really feel it happening and feel people's energy um so the fact that i had to do it all online sucked a little bit but i mean at least i got it out and there's no better time for people to listen to the music besides now what else the fuck are you gonna do at home besides listen to the album basically Um, and put your yeah (laughs) so that has been really nice um And I feel like also a really good thing to come out of this time is that all of us R&B girls are really helping each other out in this time. You know, we're really lifting each other up and being there for each other online. Online interactions are like 10 times more, like you feel them way more because you're not not getting that like face-to-face interaction with people. So it's really nice to get that like sign off from people that you respect and people that you work alongside with. Um, and we've been really good at that because, you know, we're stuck inside. So we're trying to help as much as we can for each other. Wonderful. Well, now we have reached the games portion. Oh, so yes. We'll let Eddie, take it away. I love games. Can we have like a ding ding? Is there like a oh, yeah, sound I've got on the, your board? I've got... or... Okay. Ooh, okay. Can you explain the rules, please, Eddie? Absolutely. We're going to play a game called Name your tune. It's kind of like name that tune, but you're naming your own tune. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some lyrics from some of your songs and we'll narrow it down. They'll be from Kiki because that's the genesis of the concert. Okay, good. New baby. And yes. I'm going to give you some lyrics and you got to tell me the song. So we hopefully, hopefully you know your own music. Yeah, hopefully. You ready? Mm. Yeah. All right. Will Kiana be able to recognize her own bars? Her or will she be words. like Nas performing? <laughs> she got that look on her face. She's concerned. She wants to. The she world is yours. Right now. Oh my God. See. I don't know. <laughs> All right. First one. I'm pretty little bitch. I let him see. And my pussy is a pleasure. That's the That's tea. That's the tea. Moving. So, mm. can we talk about what that actually Can she get a ding? Oh, What's sorry. up with the ding? Yeah, where's my ding? Sorry, I just wanted to really understand what that really was, but you Thank get the you. Ding. Go ahead. I'm a pretty little bitch. I let him see and my pussy is a pleasure. That's the T. Seems I mean, pretty self-explanatory. Pretty self-explanatory. My pussy is a pleasure. That's the fucking T. As you sip your tea from your uh from her teacup. From, from her very fancy kettle that we were introduced to earlier today. Fancy. Uh, next one. When you're out having sweet dreams, I'll be your beautiful nightmare. Plenty more. A nod to Beyonce's beautiful nightmare, because that is my jam. Oh, sweet that. dreams or so beautiful so nightmare. Beautiful. Either way, I. <laughs> Plenty more is one of my favorite records. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, three more. I might slash the tires in your car. Already got the windows. I ain't even say I'm sorry. Crazy. So, true story. That happened to me, oddly enough, in Arizona. I was dating this girl, and I was dating another girl, and she got upset, and I came home, and... Wait, 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 wait. Are you a hoe, Eddie? You just brushed past the... I was the dating hoeing. her and I was dating another girl. Ding. Where's the ding? I don't have a ding. Where's the ding? No, we need a buzzer for that. What are you talking about? The buzzer. <laughs> no. Buzzer. Buzz yourself. But, but she knew. That was the thing. Like, she knew. I was in a fraternity. I'm still in a fraternity. What's that got to do with you being a hoe? Uh, who said I was a hoe? 
I resent you. That. You said you were dating one girl and then you were dating somebody else, but apparently they didn't know. See, the pimping is to tell people that you're seeing other people. But she then you can knew. do whatever you want. She knew. I came home in the back window. I had a I had a ninety eight Pontiac red. It was great. It was like my baby. And she busted the window out of the back car and she slashed my left rear tire. I remember it. I had to pay. Because she didn't know about the girl or because she was just mad. She found out about the other girl. I came home. I got dropped off and I came home and my window was busted. She, so, but so she it didn't, didn't, didn't do the player card. You did. Listen, listen. This is about Kiki. This is not about Eddie. No, this is about Eddie and his I mean, yeah, you know, this is Eddie. story. Beep. We don't have no sound. I'm sorry, so but I'm not sorry about the <laughs> Moving right along. Yeah. Next one. <laughs> I'm not sorry. And I'm going. Uh, I'm hoping that the distance going to make you want to kiss him. My pussy like a vacation. A vacation you've been waiting on. Separation. Sounds like a quarantine anthem. Honestly, it's like the struggle is so real. Honestly. For real, seeing for a real. lot of people out here struggling in these Twitter streets, just like <laughs> man, like the Twitter, the COVID bay, quarantine yeah. bay. I'm like, how does that work though? You can't. You just do you just Facetime? I don't know. No, she's yeah, Facetime. She Facetime her boo. Her boo's coming home in the next seven minutes. So that's not social distancing though. So I guess doesn't mean no. That. It is your business is. is yours, he, Kiki. He has been social distancing with me, but he had to go back to his apartment for something. Okay, there He's you go. See, she's safe. Gone. Don't we worry. Are He's gloves. Got it. Got it. Do we have one more? Or are you... we, have, we have one more because she's four for four. Let's make it five out of five. Minding my business, all of a sudden, my daddy issues be coming from nothing. Protection. Look at you knowing your lyrics. Good job. I mean, I would hope so. I wrote them. I mean, child, everybody well, doesn't. We, we know a lot of artists that don't write their lyrics, so. Or remember, or remember them. Or remember them. That's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> different conversation for a whole different day. That's hard. Yeah, we're gonna get into well, like. How you know? I really write my own songs out here. Black, 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 black. Well, we want to say Southside Phoenix writes their own I, lyrics, even remembers them when it's time. Black, black. High school stand up. Book, book, book. We want to thank Diana Lede Brown. Fact. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Fun fact. Go ahead. I went to online school for the last two years of high school, but my principal loved me so much at Mountain Point that I actually got to walk in the graduation and sing national anthem. <laughs> Thank you. So you have two degrees. <laughs> you have two high school degrees. No. But I did have two high school graduations. But you Eddie, why are you fucking up the mood? <laughs> Because I thought she was going to like drop the bomb. Like, yeah, actually, motherfucker, I got two, I got two actually, degrees. I have a GED and a diploma. I'm, I'm reminded of a Kanye West skit. I knew you were going to do it. I knew you were going to do it. <laughs> Are we really going to bring up Kanye right now? After all he's done? It's old Kanye before he it's was old Kanye. this Kanye. I used to work with old Kanye. Oh, okay. But let those degrees keep you warm. Uh, see, anyway, the build up, uh, all of that for that. Uh, I can't remember the exact lyrics. Do you see what I'm dealing with? Do you see? Uh, Kiki? Nonetheless, I'm the silver fox. Why that, don't I have uh, the buzzer? I could put it to better, better use. Oh, because you don't get it. I get the buzzer. I know, because you don't want to buzz yourself. I can say Kiana Lede Brown, that's her government, <laughs> aka Thug Kiki, aka Slasher Tires, aka Don't Fuck with the South Side of Phoenix. Ladies and gentlemen, Keanu Lede. <laughs> We're out of here in the cast of R&B. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Don't ruin the outro. 